Amen. What a blessing. I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Romans chapter number 3. Romans chapter number 3, we have uh, been preaching out of the book of Romans. We're not going through the book of Romans, but I'm, I'm going to preach uh, messages in the book of Romans uh, uh, at the uh, well, today, and then probably start it up again uh, after August, so I guess it'd be September. Um, so please be in prayer for that, as we'll be continuing, as we're looking in some doctrine things that, that uh, are concerning the church through the book of Rome, uh, Romans. Now, in Romans chapter number 3, uh, we're going to be looking in verses number 21 through verses number 25, and I want to read those as we start off and... Then we'll pray and get right into the message. Father, uh, verse number 21 says, But now the righteous of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Let me read that once again. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through redemption that, that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath sent forth to be an appitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of, of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Let's pray. Father, I do thank you so much for your word. And Lord, I pray, God, that you'd help me. I do humble myself before you, realizing I'm just a man. And Lord, I pray that you would calm my spirit. And Lord, that you would give me uh, utterance, uh, uh, clarity of speech and uh, remembrance. And Lord, I pray that you would just uh, have your will, Lord, uh, that I'd be able to cover this and not, uh, not uh, get off track, uh, that we may be able to uh, enjoy what's to come afterward. And Lord, I pray that you would bless and have your will once again. I do wish that your will be done above all that is said and done. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So much is said uh, through these verses that are of great importance. Uh, throughout the ages that has been preached and probably all the, the things that contain in just these verses have never been exalted or uh, exhausted uh, through all the preaching that has already been done on these. But the, the major message that comes out of this portion of, uh, of, of Scripture could be entitled, how to be right with God. How to be right with God. Job in the Old Testament asked this question. Uh, this very important question. And that uh, in Job chapter 9 and verse number 2. He asked this same question. How shall a man be right before God? Look what it says in verse number 2. And I want to read several portions of scripture. It says, I know it is so of a truth, but how shall man be justified with God? If he will contend with him, he cannot answer him one of a thousand. He is wise in heart and mighty in strength. Who has hardened himself against him and hath prospered? which removeth the mountains, and they know not, which overturneth them in, in his anger, which shaketh the earth without her, uh, out of her place, and the pillars thereof tremble, which, com uh, which commandeth the sun, and it riseth not, and sealeth up the stars, which uh, alone spreadeth out the heavens, and trouble it and, and tread it upon the, the waves of the sea, which maketh Iraq and Orion and, Pre and Pleiades and 
the chambers of the south, which doeth great things past finding out, yea, the wonders and wonders without number. Lo, he goeth by me, and I see, I see him not. He passes on also, but I perceive him not. Behold, he taketh away who can hinder him. Who will say unto him, will, what dost thou? If God, will not, if God will not withdraw his anger, the poor, the poor helpers do stop under him, do stoop under him. Uh, how much less shall I answer him and choose out my words to, to reason with him? Whom, whom thou, uh, whom through, whom, though I were righteous, yet would I not answer, but I would make supplication to my judge. If, if I have called and he hath answered me, yet would I not believe that he hath hearkened unto my voice? For he breaketh me with a tempest and multiplieth my wounds without cause. He, he will not suffer me to take a breath, but filleth me with bitterness. If I speak of strength, lo, he is strong. And if of judgment, who shall set me at a time to plea? If I justify myself, my own mouth shall condemn me. If I say I am perfect, it shall also prove me perverse. That is what Job answered in the question, who can know God? That how can he approach this mighty God in a relationship? How can he be, have a, such a relationship with God? with the mighty and holy and powerful God as such? That is the question. That is the question of, of, of what man has sought, a right relationship with an holy, infinite, mighty God. How is this possible? How can it be? Well, that is the question that our text answers before us today. That is the, that is the question that, that our text gives the, the, the resounding answer of, yes, you can. Yes, it is possible. But how, how can man be right with God? Although human history, all through human history, man is, uh, has asked himself this same question. And what the evidence of that has been is religious, or religions throughout the world. Religions throughout the world reveal the, the, that man seeks to be right with God, to be right before God. How else can man escape the, the sense of lostness, of guiltiness, of, of loneliness, of, of emptiness, of, of meaninglessness? How else can he eliminate that fear of death? You see, even religion, every religion of the word offers this answer to that question. Every religion in the world suggests that that a man can have a right relationship with God. But the Bible is clear in demonstrating that a man can be right with God, but not on the basis of anything that he does. It is not on the basis of what he does. And in this, Christianity stands apart from every other religion that is in the world today. In fact, there are only two religions in the world. One is that of human achievement, that man works as hard as he can to be as good as he can, that he would please God. The other is that of divine accomplishment, and that is how Christianity stands alone. It relies on God itself and what God has done, not on what man has done. Now, the Bible says a man can be right with God, but he cannot be right with God in his own terms. He cannot make it himself right with God. It is not to his end by which he becomes right with God. If man 
if men are to be right with God, it has to happen from God's end, not from man's end. Man has no ability to be able to make himself, to work himself, to bring himself up to the place where God desires or demands for righteousness. It is impossibility. It is impossible for man to reach this. Now, basically, the first part of Paul's epistle to the Romans shows that nobody can be right with God. This is on the basis of human effort. There's no way, according to human effort, that we can be right with God. In fact, if we looked at verse number 9 of chapter number 3, it says, what then? Are we better than they? He brings the, the understanding that there's none better, no, whether it's, whether it's Jew or Greek, there's none, for they've all gone out of the way. Both of them have become guilty before God. Both of them, or all of them, are under sin. Every single one of them. If we can go back to chapter number 1 in verse number 18. And it says, For the, wage, or the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of man. Paul shows that all men are under sin. And therefore, they are under the judgment of God. All of them. Every single one of them. There's none. Then as we come into chapter 2 and verses 2 and 3, we see that God is the judge. He will judge according to the facts. We are, have that assurance that God judges according to the truth against them who commit such things. Listen to what it says. In verse number 2 of chapter number 2, it says, But we are sure that, ju that, that the judgment of God is according to truth against them that commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judges them which do such things, and doeth the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? There's no escaping the judgment of God, for all of us are under the condemnation of sin. Every single person. Everybody. In other words, he says, God is going to judge all men for all of sin. God is going to judge on the basis of, of, everybody, uh, of, of truth. Everybody's going to get judged because every man who has been is in sin and continues in sin. In verse number 11, he sums it up with this right here. He says, For there is no respect of persons with God. There's no preference. There's nobody that is set above anybody else. If anybody would say that I'm not in that group, they would have to read verse number 11. For there's no preference. All have sinned. Verse number 12 says, it says this right here. It says, For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law. And as many as, shall, as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. So the Greek and the Jew and the Gentile, those who, who know and those who do not, all are sinful and will be judged and all will be judged by the fact whether they be of the law or without the law. Then we come to verse number, chapter number 3 and verse number 10. Listen to what he says as he, as he writes this further condemnation of man as it is written. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. There is none. Uh, I'm sorry. They have all gone out of the way. They are all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. And then he gives the description of mankind. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongue, they have used deceit. 
the poison of asper in their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and mystery are all in their way. And the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. This is the summation of the characteristic of God that given to man that he is wicked. We say there, that group sure is. That group is wicked. That group is vile and ungodly. Can I remind you, this is the same group that we're of. This is the same people that we come out of. We come to verse number 19, and he says in the middle of that verse that every mouth may be stopped. All these things are brought to pass to show that mankind stands before God proclaiming with all that he is. And God says every mouth is stopped. There's no defense. There's nothing to be said. The world is guilty before God. Well, some would say, what about the people that do good things? We'll read what it says in verse number 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall there be no flesh, or shall no flesh be justified in his sight. It does not matter how good someone is and how much of the law they keep or how good they do the deeds that are in the law. They'll not be justified in his sight. A man cannot be right with God from his own end. Man is a sinner. All men are under the condemnation of that sin. Everybody. Whether religious or, ir or, in relig or irreligious. They will be judged according to the facts of their unrighteousness. And they cannot be right before God in their own beings. There's no way. There's no defense for them. They are all become guilty before God. Their mouth has been stopped. There's no utterance for them. There's silence. There's nothing more for them to say. True religion. Our true religious people. Many times I remember when we were in Mexico. Seeing the, the herds of people that would come. On pilgrimages. To do the will of God, they thought. To receive repentance. As they would march down the road. Thousands and thousands. Riding bikes. Some crawling to the altar. Some being carried by the wayside. To receive repentance. By the deeds that they do. Yet. They'll find themselves in lack before God, for none shall be justified in that way. The Jews themselves were, wouldn't receive it. They had to come to an understanding that they were sinners before God, even though they kept the law. Even though in their eyes, they, 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 they were the ones that were the keepers of the law. Well then, what is the law of God? For if it can't be kept, what good is it? Well, it's very simple. It shows you that you can't keep it. God set the law to reveal to man that he is not able to keep it. That it is impossible. That there's no way for, for him to live up to it. It is that standard by which is greater than he is. It is the standard of God. Paul said in Romans chapter number 7, in verse number 7, it says this right here. It says, what shall we say then? Is, a, is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I have not found sin, but by the law. For I have not known lust, except the law say, thou shalt not covet. God has given the law not as that man can live up to it, but so that man can know that he can't 
live up to it and seek righteousness that he can't generate on his own. So the way to God is not by human effort. It's impossible. It's impossible for us to reach God on our own. This is true even in the Old Testament. Many people believe that the, that, the, that the men and women of the Old Testament received righteousness because of the sacrifices and the rituals by which they did. But this is not true. They received righteousness because of what they believed in God as obedience to those sacrifices. It was not the, the action. It was the faith in what God had said for them to do. Faith has always been the way. Always been the way. Listen to what it says in Micah chapter number 6. In verse number 6 and 7. It says. It says. Wherewith shall I come, unto, uh, come before the Lord. And bow myself before the high God. Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with a calf of a year old? With the, will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams and with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn uh, for, for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? What he is saying is, what am I going to do to be right with God? Will it be, as the Old Testament said, the prescription of sacrifices? Will it be bringing thousands of sacrifices before him? Or even offering up his son as a burnt offering? What am I going to do to be right with God? Well, the implication in the scripture that is given is there's nothing. That none of these things are that by which pleases God. All have sinned and are under judgment. And are equally unable and incapable of making anything right with God void of that judgment. Every mouth is stopped. There is none righteous, no, not one. Simply means nobody is right before God, and that means you. That means me. Nobody. We have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. But the good thing is that from chapter 1 through chapter number 2 and verse number 20 there, God gives this, this, this bleak view of mankind and then the breaking of the dawn comes forth. In verse number 21 it says, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest. This phrase in chapter number 21, it, the key of it is in the very first two words. But now. But now. What does it mean? It means this present time. This present time, God has revealed a righteousness. A righteousness. But now the righteousness of God is without the law manifested. That's what man has to have. The righteousness of God. That which he cannot generate on his own. What does the righteousness mean? It means to be right with God. It means to be right. It means to have things right. To have things in the right order. That's what God desires. And in verse number 21, he, he, he reveals this righteousness. But it is not the righteousness of man. It is the righteousness of God. And that righteousness is important. The Bible says in the Old Testament in Isaiah, it says that our righteousness is as filthy rags. That they're filthy rags. We would think that this is just a mound of rags that had been sitting there and they're just nasty. But that is not the meaning that is behind the, the, the uh, original meaning of the word. It is that of minstrel rags. That is disgusting. That is, that it, that is so, so disgusting that no one wants to be around it. And that is what man's best is before God. The righteousness of what man has is not able and cannot, will not, and never will reach that what God desires. It is impossible. 
So the light comes from God. Not up from man, but down from God. God comes through the rescue and finds man in an impossible situation and brings him to deliverance. That is the picture that Paul paints before us. That man is at a place where he cannot get out of, where he cannot reach up from. And God comes forth to the rescue from the midst of man's darkness. But now, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. Now you notice the term in verse number 21, righteousness. We've already said it means to be right. But it means to be right in righteousness. It means to be good over against that which is evil. It means to be holy against, over and against that which is unholy. It means to be pure over against that which is dirty and, and, and filthy. It is to be right before God, right with God. And this is a righteousness that, that comes from God and is different from any other righteousness that we ever know. Now, let's look at some of the difference of this righteousness. First of all, I want you to notice that this righteousness is different because of its author. It's, it's author. In Isaiah chapter number 45, and verse number 8, it says, Drop down, ye heavens, from above, and let the sky pour down righteousness. Let the earth open, and let them bring forth salvation, and let righteousness spring up together. I, the Lord, have created it. It is created by God. It is created righteousness, which is the righteousness. This is why the righteousness is different, because God made it. God made it. It is very different than any other creation by man. It is authored by God, that he brought it down, that he gave it. That he is the author of it. Now, I want you to see another difference. Another difference is it, this righteousness has a nature, a different nature. What do you mean? What do we mean? Well, it is a righteousness that both fulfills the precept and the penalty of the law. Jesus came to to fulfill God's righteousness. He was perfect. He did the will of God. He spoke only the words of God. He, viola he, he never violated God's principles. He, he never moved against God's will. He never sinned, not one time. And, and though he never did one evil, he never thought one evil word or did one evil uh, uh, incident, uh, uh, a work of, uh, of unkindness. He was absolutely without sin, perfect in every way, the righteousness revealed in all its precepts of the law. He was that. He was that that fulfilled every pre precept that God had given in the law. He kept the law for God perfectly. And now, in him, the righteousness be uh, be was that man could receive. It was through Jesus. That's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter number 5. And verse number 20. It says for I say unto you. That except you ex your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. You shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. There is the righteousness that man has. That it is the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees by what they would do to enter in. But they could not get in that way. There was no way, and everything that they did brought them to the same place that they were lacking before God. But this righteousness, this righteousness met the demands of God and absolutely fulfilled the whole law flawlessly. Now secondly, this righteousness died perfect, uh, perfecting and fulfilling the penalty of the law. Jesus went to the cross and again fulfilled righteousness because God is right and because God is holy and because God has to punish sin. Christ had to die. 
Christ had to die to provide the penalty by which would satisfy him. And he only is that satisfaction. So this righteousness is different due to the, the author, due to the, the very nature of what kind of righteousness it is that it, that it provided perfectly the precept and the penalty that comes with sin. But I want you to see thirdly that, that it is not only uh, has a divine author and provided the, the precept and the penalty, but it is also has a duration of eternity. That it will never grow old. It will never lose its, uh, it, its saving power. It will never be that by which will will fade away. It will always be the righteousness that is set there forever for man to draw from. Throughout the Bible, the, the everlasting righteousness of God is, is declared. In Daniel chapter number 9 and verse number 24, it talks about the everlasting righteousness. In Psalms chapter number 119, verse number 142, talks about the everlasting righteousness that it will forever uh, it is an ever it is a forever righteousness in Hebrews chapter number nine in verse number 12 talks about the ever uh, the eternal redemption provided for us in Hebrews chapter number 10 in verse number 17 it is a perfect forever sanctify, uh sacrifice uh, of the offering on the cross of Christ. This is the righteousness that is given to us. This is the righteousness that that Paul reveals. Now, I, I, this is all introduction to get me where I need to be. Uh, I, 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 there's actually three points, but I just want to cover one point this morning concerning how to be right with God. He has already given to us in, in, in Romans chapter number 3 and verse number 21, He's given to us that, but now, but now, now after Christ has died at, 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 and, and now that, that Christ has, has, has came, he has become that righteousness of God that is without law. And I want you to see something that, that this righteousness is apart from. It is apart from legalism. There, there are so many that, that cling to legalism and righteousness to be able to please God. Now it says this right here. That, that it was without law. It was apart from the law. It was not a part of the law. It was apart from the law. Without law. As many. The little word that is given here. As we study Paul's epistle, this Greek word nomos, or law, we have to be very careful as we look into it. Because it, Paul uses it in a lot of different ways. Sometimes he refers to legalism. Sometimes he refers to uh, ceremonial law. Sometimes he re refers to the moral law of God. Sometimes he refers to the Old Testament. Sometimes he, he refers to the principles uh, like a general law. But he uses it in, very, in, 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 in a lot of different ways as he gives it throughout this epistle especially, but throughout all the epistles that, he, that, that Paul wrote. In fact, in this very same verse, he uses the word law in two different ways. The righteousness is apart from the law. And then he says, but the witness, but it is witnessed by the law. He uses law in two different ways. The first I want to look at, he says, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest. Righteousness is apart from the law. Now, I believe it's clear here that he is talking about legalism. That he is talking about those that are, that are looking to, ma that, to make it on their own. 
man-made effort. Man-made effort. He says that it's apart from the law. So this righteousness is apart from the law. That means that, that it's apart from man's effort to keep and to, to stay or to keep all the rules in the system of God. We don't gain our righteousness by the things that we're able to do or even, in, or even to be strengthened by. There are a lot of people that cannot understand this. There are a lot of people that cannot perceive this because they're wrapped up in religion. They're wrapped up in what I'm doing, how I'm able to make it, and they get lost in that. But the law of God only works wrath. It never works forgiveness. It never works repentance. It only works wrath. Listen to what it says in Romans chapter number 4 and verse number 15. It says, but the law worketh. And it says, because the law worketh wrath. In other words, God is showing his right to be angry with us because we're sinners. Because we cannot keep the standard by which he set that is righteous, that is holy, that is true. So God says, if you cannot keep that, then you're under the judgment of it. Listen to what it says in Romans chapter 3 and verse number 28. It says, therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Without the deeds of the law. This is a major principle of the New Testament that is given. That it is just that man becomes justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. It is not the law that justifies, nor bringeth righteousness to man. It is faith, and faith alone. It is the same thought given in, in, that, that man cannot reach the righteousness of God by anything that he does. In Romans chapter 4 and verse number 6, it says, even as David also described the blessedness of a man unto whom God imputes righteousness without works. This is apart from anything that man does. In Galatians chapter number 2 and verse number 16, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, the same idea is given. Works of the law. In Galatians chapter number 2, verse number 21, I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ died in vain. This is very important. That if we can make it to heaven or if we could become righteous without Christ dying, then why would Christ have to die? He had to die because we are incapable of becoming righteous before God. In Galatians chapter number 3 and verse number 10, it says, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. All the people that... that that do works to, to get to God, they'll be judged under the curse of the law. Why? For it is written, Curse is every one that continueth not in the things which are written in the book of the law to do them. If you miss it on one point, you missed it on all points. If we cannot can keep every single thing, then we keep none of it. In Galatians chapter number 3 and verse number 11 says, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. If they could be, then it would be called legalism. Ephesians chapter number 2 and verse number 8 says this right here. For by grace are you saved through what? Faith. That not of yourself. It is a gift of God. Not of what? Works. At least who would boast? We would. See, we were, it, God had set it up that there's no way for man to get out except they come to God bankrupt. 
He creates in us the righteousness that, that He desires through Jesus Christ, and we become His workmanship. We become His workmanship. Salvation is a workmanship of God that is created in Christ Jesus unto good works. That's what we're to be. 2 Timothy chapter number uh, 1 and verse number 9 says, Who has saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works? It wasn't because of what we did, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus. God gave His righteousness in Christ Jesus because Christ Jesus was and is the righteousness of God. God manifested it. It's manifested in our Savior, Jesus Christ. When Christ came, the righteousness of God was manifested. It was, not, it was known. Those, that key word, those two key words that are given, but now. But now. Christ has come, He's lived and died, and but now He is manifested to us. We have the ability to receive it. We have the, the ability to have the redemption by which God desires. In Timothy chapter number 3 and verse number 5, it says, not Timothy, I'm sorry, Titus, chapter number 3 and verse number 5. It says, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. According to His mercy He saved us. Not our works. Not because we were pretty good people. Not because we, 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 you know, we were up to the stuff. Not because, you know, we never did anything really bad. No, it's because of His righteousness. Listen, it's not of our works. Philippians chapter number 3 and verse number 9 says this right here. It says, and being found in Him, not having my own righteousness, there has to come a time in our life where we realize and we take part in and say it's not in our own righteousness which is by the law or of the law but that which is through faith in Christ. Christ. The righteousness which is of God by faith. That's where it's at. That's what it's all about. It's not about me. It's not about what I can do. It's not about getting wh what I can. It's about God providing everything in Christ for me. My realization is that I am bankrupt before God. There is a righteousness that can be made, that can make us right before God. But this righteousness is not man's. It's the righteousness of God. It doesn't raise from man, but it comes down from God. He is the authority of it. He is the creator of it. Its nature is perfect, and its duration is forever. Can I tell you, this righteousness is Christ. Revealed to us. If you're here today, I want you to realize, if you realize nothing else, that you have nothing in you to get to God. Christ did it all. Let's stand together with heads bowed and eyes closed. Father, I thank you so much for your good grace and mercy. And Lord, I pray, God, that you'll help us. Lord, help us to see many across this world and around this world and in this this country and in this, this community here are blinded by the fact that they think that they can do good enough to get to God. And if they'll do enough repentance, Hail Marys, rotary, ro rosaries, our fathers, 
If they'll sacrifice enough. Oh God, how I pray, Lord, that our that their eyes would be opened, that our eyes would be opened, that we would be able to see truth, that there's nothing, 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 nothing that we can do to get to you in our own self. But you sent Christ, the fulfillment of your righteousness, provided the desire of the law and the penalty and price of sin on our behalf. And if we'll believe by faith, we can be right with God. Lord bless, I pray. And have your will in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Jeff, what are we going to sing? Jesus paid it all. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Check hands one another. You're dismissed.